Welcome back to this uh, keynote session of the Battle of Ideas. Uh, growth is good, mission or mania, question uh, mark. My name is Angus Kennedy. I convene the Institute of Ideas uh, Academy. And you can tell by the title, this uh, session is going to be about economic growth. Uh, what is it good for, if you like? Uh, it's been organized by the Institute of Ideas Economy Forum, which I must declare an interest in. Um, and in association with uh, the newspaper City AM. The context, of course, uh, and I suppose this has been a sort of a bad, a bad news, good news uh, week in terms of thinking about this session. Uh, the bad news is the economy, um, the Eurozone, the notable absence of growth in France, Germany, uh, in Italy, low inf inflation, uh, and some, I suppose you might call it volatility uh, in the stock markets. Um, the good news, of course, is, is that's exactly what we were hoping would happen in just before uh, we have this session on economic growth. Uh, so that, that plan has worked out well. I was quite nervous during the summer uh, when we were listening to all the stories about how the UK is now the economic powerhouse of the entire world, uh, if not the universe, uh, that the whole idea of this session had been fatally misconceived. So, no, uh, we do need to talk about growth. The, the thought was to talk about growth after a long period of recession. The UK, despite the problems, has only just returned to its sort of pre-2008 crisis levels. It's been a long time uh, coming uh, in that recovery. And, you know, you, there is a sort of a hunger for growth. You know, people have been bigging it up, saying, goodness me, at last we've got some growth back. And I wanted to just use this as, as time maybe to reflect back to some of the discussions that were very influential pre-crisis, but also, I think, on our, an ongoing background accompaniment to the discussion about growth, which is sometimes to, to question the validity of it. Uh, there's a certain level uh, that we need, and we get nervous when we fall below it. But there are also concerns about uh, large levels of inequality in society, uh, views that that's created by too much growth. What growth there is goes to the wrong people or to the wrong places that we are still doing too much damage uh, to the planet, wanting to frack this and shale that and have uh, more, 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 the sort of uh, greedy consumerism sort of side of the argument. So that's just the context, you know, we wanted to ask this question, is it right to argue that growth on its own just might be a good thing, or do we need certain amounts of growth and something else? Sometimes it's happiness or well-being is the something else, or, or is just growth enough on its own? So my panel, uh, we're very happy, uh, agreed to join us this afternoon when it's so sunny outside. First to speak, and, and I'll introduce them in the order in which uh, they're going to speak. On my left, Ricardo Fuentes Nieva. Uh, Ricardo is the head of uh, research at Oxfam uh, GB, and he's the co-author of Working for the Few, Political Capture and Economic Inequality. He'll be followed by, by my close left, Daniel Benami, uh, who's a finance and economics writer, uh, the author of Ferraris for All uh, in Defense of Economic Progress and also another book, Cowardly Capitalism. Third to speak will be Kitty Usher on my far right, whose biography gives away little, Managing Director of Tooley Street Research, an independent uh, public policy research company that Kitty set up after her experience in public policy work as a MP and a minister in the former government. Last to speak will be Mark Littlewood, Mark's the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs, uh, the IEA, and co-founder of Progressive Vision. Uh, he says it's a classical liberal think tank. Ricardo, would you like to get us kicked off? Maybe that, that, uh, that question is a bit misleading, uh, whether growth is good or bad. Um, I think uh, it, it, it'll, be, it'll be hard to find someone who seriously thinks that growth should be eliminated completely. Uh, I, think, I think the real question is what kind of growth do we, do we, do we want and whether we can achieve it or not. So it's, it's about the quality of growth and, and the political decisions that, that the different governments take around the world to either maximize uh, growth per se 
or, or take into account different uh, aspects that, that, that can reduce certain, uh, like half a point on growth, but then take into consideration other elements. So, so Angus was saying there's a hunger for growth. Um, uh, given the, 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 the recession over the, the last few years in, in different countries, countries in the Eurozone and, 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 and in the UK. And I think it's true that, that growth has been a proxy for other things that we consider well-being. The, the problem is that th that doesn't always happen. There are moments in which, in, 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 in which economic growth is not that proxy for economic well-being. And, and uh, as, we, as, as we gather more evidence and more data, we see that that's, uh, that's the case. So, so there's a, a recent uh, document that shows using tax records and the returns of, of, uh, of, um, of economic growth for the, for the richest 1%, that shows that they benefit a lot from economic growth recently. So, so, but that's the current context, and, and that wasn't happening before. So, so the growth that we see uh, recently is, is growth that is really good for the, for the, for the very rich. Um, the, the, the document that Angus mentioned, Working for the Few, uh, we released that document at, at the beginning of the year, and, and, and in, in that document we showed that the 85 richest people in the world own as much wealth as the bottom half of the population. That was one of the, the, the big findings of, of that report. But another one uh, showed that using, using, using these, these databases uh, collected by Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Saez and all that, that since the financial crisis in the U.S. in 2008, 95% of all economic growth has gone to the 1%, whereas the 90 poorest, the, 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 the bottom 90% of the, of the American distribution has become poorer. So you've seen positive economic growth in the US since 2008, but, but that has been accompanied by a 95% capture of that growth by 1% of the population. So, so I think the, the, the question is, do we want to maximize economic growth, regardless of what's the quality of it, regardless of what's happening within the distribution, regardless of, of, of what's happening to the things that we cannot, cap, ca, cannot capture or measure with, 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 um, with the current statistics? And I think that's, that, that's the real question. The real question is, uh, are, policy, are policy makers in different countries actually deciding to maximize growth, regardless of the details? You know, and, and what happens when, 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 when economic growth is no longer that proxy for well-being and, and, and for standard of living that, that, that we think uh, it is? It, it, one of, I mean, one of the, the things that we see in, in many parts of the world is the stagnation of wages in the presence of growth. So, so do we think that economic growth will solve the stagnation of wages? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe there, there are things that need to be done to actually increase the wages of, of, of the middle class. In my experience, uh, so, so some people say, well, actually, you know, policymakers are a lot more sophisticated than, 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 than just looking at economic growth. They look at, at uh, indicators of health, indicators of education, indicators of, of uh, housing, and all kinds of things. You know, because policy making is a complex issue, and there are different ministries that actually take a look at what are the trends and what is the progress on all those things. But in my experience, I used to work for the United Nations and the, and the Human Development Report. And, uh, and we, we used to publish the Human Development Index. And, and, and when presenting that index in, in different audiences, uh, policymakers, they were always competing. So, so the policymakers in India wanted to see what was the ranking relative to Pakistan. And the policymakers in Brazil wanted to see what was the ranking relative to, to Argentina and, and the like. And I've, I've seen policymakers actually competing on their economic growth rates. So, so and, 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 and that's I mean, one of the, the, I mean, in my view, one of the dangers of focusing too much on one single indicator, because then it becomes something that, that, that policymakers actually can, 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 can boast about, can say, well, I mean, look at, look at my impressive economic growth rates, 
Uh, and, and when you ask them what's happening with, with the rest, they said, well, I mean, but look at my impressive economic growth rates. And I know that, not, that doesn't happen always and in every, in every single country, but I've seen it happening. And I, I think that's, that's one of, 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 of the, the, the challenges that, that we face when we, when we think about uh, economic growth. So to summarize, I, I, I think uh, economic growth has, has been one of the, the uh, I mean, one of the key uh, changes in the history of humankind uh, over the past 200 years. No one could deny that e economic growth actually changed the way we live. But, uh, but, but, but uh, in a way, obsessing over one single figure without looking at, at other at, at other indicators can be can be can be can be damaging for 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 the potential progress of societies and and uh, and the current context a uh, context in which uh, e um, economic inequality has been increasing for the past 30 years in 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 a, in a large chunk of the world and and the current context in which there's a lot of volatility uh, suggests that that we need to we need to be careful with with uh, with just asking for more growth without without actually paying close attention to the quality of that growth Brilliant. thank you very much Ricardo. Right, well, well, I want to argue, uh, contrary to Ricardo, that economic growth is an unqualified good, that we really should be pursuing economic growth. And in fact, contrary to what he said, I don't think it's true that politicians across the world are doing it or have been doing it uh, for a long time. Because I think the mainstream view uh, is people will say, yeah, you know, economic growth is okay, which is you know, more or less what uh, Ricardo said, but we've got to respect limits, you know, we've got to take into account inequality and we've got to take into account happiness, we've got to take into account the environment. And at first sight, this sounds, it does sound very compelling and very commonsensical. Or sometimes pe people use the, limit, the language of economics of trade-offs or trade-offs between the environment and growth and so on. Uh, but I think that's fundamentally the wrong way to look at it. And although economic growth certainly isn't everything in the world, there are other important things. In terms of our material well-being, economic growth is extremely important and really, really central. It's not just something else you, like you've got a little bit of this here and that there, oh, and you've got economic growth. It's been really, really central uh, to our well-being and that, in fact, was one of the real uh, intellectual breakthroughs of the Enlightenment uh, of the 18th century, Adam Smith, understanding that the economy and economic growth was central to prosperity. And did he prove right? Absolutely. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, a person who likes bombarding others with statistics, but just to give you my one favourite statistic, if you take the average life expectancy in 1800, it was round about 30. If you take the uh, latest available uh, life expectancy, it's actually the figures for 2012, but it's just been published recently, it's 73. That is a global figure. Now, that is absolutely phenomenal. You think about it. On, on average, 43 years more of life. And this is a figure across for the whole world. So taking in 7 billion people across the world, this is absolutely incredible. And I would say that that improvement is related to economic growth and the parallel processes of scientific development, technological innovation. It's very much to do with economic growth. Uh, some people say, well, okay, yeah, well, that, it, it's, the part of that, it's true that in the past it's been very useful, but we in the West, we've reached the stage where it's no longer so important because we're pretty well off and economic growth doesn't really matter. Again, that's a big argument to have, uh, but if you want to disprove it or argue against it, I would say look at the last few years because what I would get from the last few years, if you look at uh, Japan, America, uh, North America and Western Europe, is you know, you've had economic contraction, uh, you've had a lack of growth or growth going into reverse, and I would argue that has played a very big part in the kind of uh, suffering and dislocation and the problems people have suffered over recent years. It's not growth, it's precisely the opposite. It's the lack of growth that has been the problem and the reversal of the growth process. So I would argue even in the West, we could do with more growth and more development, let alone in the poorer countries in uh, the global south or the third world or whatever terminology you use, all of us could do with more growth. We haven't yet reached the end of the growth process. Now, what about the idea of limits? 
uh, in relation to inequality, in relation to the environment, in relation to happiness. Uh, maybe just to stick, I don't know how much time I've got, but just to stick to begin with uh, to the environment and climate change, because that's a big topic. If you look at the discussion of climate change, and here I'm not talking so much about the scientific discussion, but the discussion had by uh, policymakers, almost invariably they'll say, well, climate change is a big problem, and you know, perhaps they're right on that, but the conclusion they draw is, well, what we therefore need to do is to constrain growth, to constrain consumption, because yeah, a certain amount of growth is okay, but climate change is a big problem, therefore we need to have a trade-off, we need to respect limits, we need to constrain growth. I would argue it's fundamentally wrong to counterpose those two things. Because to the extent climate change is the problem, and we can de debate that, but the way to tackle it is to have better technology, more resources, more innovation, so we can adapt to climate change. If we want to, for example, we can build more sea walls, we can decarbonize the energy supply, we can perhaps use geoengineering. Again, we can debate all these things. But what I think is hard to deny is that tackling what is arguably a big environmental problem needs more resources, more growth, more technological innovation rather than less. And yet the mainstream discussion is very much about behaviour. You know, let's spend less time in the shower, let's be careful how much water we use, we need to constrain growth because of the environment. So as I've said, it sounds kind of really, really commonsensical to say, okay, let's have a balance between the two. I would say absolutely wrong kind of approach. Do I have time, Angus, to talk for another minute or two? One, one minute, one minute. Maybe just to very briefly kick off the discussion on my view of the inequality thing. Because again, it sounds really, really radical. Uh, you're, you're left wing and you're concerned about inequality and isn't it a really big problem? Well, to just give, start by giving one example of where I think uh, the discussion of inequality, in fact, is very, very conservative in the current environment. You have Warren Buffett, who happens to be one of the world's richest men, uh, backed by Barack Obama, both saying, oh, inequality is really bad, we need more inequality. Obama saying inequality is, you know, really has to be one of the priorities of the Obama administration. But then what they go on to say is, well, what we really need is shared sacrifice. So in other words, what they're using is the fact that there are some very rich people in the world who've done very well out of the current economic system, which certainly is the case, but they're using that to try to persuade ordinary people to accept lower living standards or constrained living standards. So it's actually very paradoxical. It sounds very left-wing and very radical, but actually it's a way of selling recession and misery and suffering and lower living standards to the majority of popu the population. It sounds radical because they're talking about greedy bankers, but in fact it's deeply, deeply conservative. Thank you very much, Daniel. So the battle lines are drawing up. I'm going to argue that uh, growth is a means to an end rather than an end uh, in itself, uh, attempting to square the circle that has been set out by Daniel and uh, Ricardo. I take a kind of Maslowian hierarchy of needs approach, not to your individual well-being, but to the country as a whole. And the previous speakers have discussed what policymakers think. I've been one, and this is what uh, certainly my bit of the progressive centre-left uh, occasionally when it does some thinking, uh, thinks. And um, the way you describe it is this, just as uh, you need basic kind of food and shelter in order to uh, survive, and once that is sorted, you can start considering higher uh, ideals uh, to the pinnacle of self-actualization, as Maslow uh, argued. I would say that whatever type of government you are, you need to get some basic growth in the economy in order that you can attempt to achieve your own higher uh, goals. And I'll give you a, a few examples. If your higher goal is like the American Constitution, supposedly uh, the pursuit uh, of happiness, then you need to be free of the mundane tasks of getting bread on the table, which requires a certain amount of uh, prosperity. If, as Mark may or may not be about to argue, but I've heard him argue it uh, in the past, the purpose of government is fundamentally libertarian, enabling people to achieve their potential, then how can you possibly achieve your potential if you're struggling uh, to get bread on the table? So you need prosperity uh, in the system. 
If your aim is redistributive, you believe in the power of the state in order to uh, be able to take from the 1% you have to support the 99% who find things a little bit harder, then obviously if the 1% hasn't got anything, you can't redistribute uh, away from it, and so I would argue that you need uh, growth in the system. If you're a bit more technocratic and simply want to be seen as a functioning state, uh, a country that works, that isn't calling on the IMF or other people's development budgets in order to keep things ticking along, then you need to be seen as credible and be able to generate economic growth. If, like China, you want to demonstrate your geopolitical power, no better way to do it than to freak the rest of us out with 10% year-on-year growth rates uh, for a seemingly an uh, un endless period uh, of time. So I argue that it's uh, uh, necessary in, in order to uh, uh, enable countries and leaders to do what they want to do, whatever that is. Point two, nothing is ever static. Nothing static in nature, nothing static in economics, nothing static in your household incomes either. So in fact, it's not a choice between growth or no growth, it's a choice between growth and negative growth. If you ask any economist, you hardly ever get a line that stops or is straight. It's always curving up and down, up and, up and down. This is a machine that's going in a forward or a backward uh, direction. And if you've got a choice between things uh, more resources around you or less resources around you, as I argued before, you're going to have far more levers at your disposal uh, if it feels like there's more resources. So it's almost a kind of uh, false choice. Things are better when you're creating prosperity because it gives you a choice as to what uh, to do about it. Um, the title of our debate is uh, Mission or Mania, and implicit in what I've said is that a bit of mania is okay, but it matters who is being manic. Uh, we've heard about Adam Smith uh, before. The profit maximization motive is very exciting for some people and creates economic drive. Uh, and you have to, I think, accept a system where some people are driven by money in order to create profit, in order to have an overall functioning system that generates growth for you to achieve your higher ends. But I think it's very important that you should have some higher ends. So if policymakers as a whole become manic about growth, it probably will be unsustainable growth because it is not possible for a country to keep growing above a sort of natural trend rate for a sustained period of time even if, uh, as in China, that appears quite large uh, by our standards. Uh, so in order to have a mission, you have to accept some mania in the system, and you also need to realise that if a group of people is making uh, an extremely large amount of money for a sustained period of time, then there's probably something wrong with your system, and there's probably a regulatory or a taxation uh, response that is appropriate uh, in order to have a system that is sustainable and functioning. So mania for some, but not uh, for all. And my final point, uh, Chair, is I think the important thing for policymakers is to see growth with this bit of mania in it as a force, as a machine. And their job is to make sure that that machine is pointing in the direction, in the right direction, and harness the force in order to achieve the higher levels of mission. So Daniel rightly used the example of uh, green technologies. <coughs> It is not a trade-off, the environment and growth in my book, uh, because it is perfectly possible to create and shape a market that solves your higher mission if that is an environmental mission. And so I think of growth as a force like, I don't know, like the weather that can be tamed and harnessed and pointed in the right direction. But if you don't have policymakers who can think big enough uh, and put, nail their colours to the mast and say what that direction is, uh, then you end up uh, with the force uh, spewing itself out uh, everywhere. So policymakers should be uh, above it with a sense of mission, create it and use it, use the mania to achieve higher goals for society. Thank you. Mission or mania, I, I, I don't see the two in conflict at all. There's that famous phrase that virtually everything decent ever achieved, ever achieved by the human race has been achieved by a monomaniac on a mission. And uh, I'm not sure that economic growth is any different, so it can be both manic and, and a mission. Uh, is it a means to an end? Um, possibly. I mean, nobody gets happier or wiser or healthier simply because the latest batch of GDP figures have come out 2% up. But they do get wiser, ha happier and healthier because that is an indication 
that they will be able to resource the goods and services that indeed make them happier, healthier and wiser. And of course, it's fair to say, we're, therefore I'm probably not quite as extreme as Daniel, that it isn't the only thing that we as individual human beings seek in our own lives. I mean, if it was, nobody would ever retire. Uh, nobody would ever say, actually, I'd prefer to work part-time than full-time. That lowers your personal levels of growth and your individual GDP. And it seems to me conceivable that you could have a society in which we all decide we want to work half the number of hours per week and we are happy, therefore, to uh, live at a rate of half our income, whatever that happens to be, uh, and enjoy ourselves much more. So I think there are areas in which, in our individual lives and in policy terms, uh, GDP growth is not the be-all and the end-all. But by God, it matters. And uh, economic growth, and where I think I'm fully with Daniel, has been a key, key driver that I think is often overlooked, particularly in improving the position of the average and the poor, particularly in that regard. And to... Uh, I'm only going to quote a couple of statistics that you not bombard you with them from Matt Ridley's fantastic book, The Rational Optimist. Most books I find that come out about economics and political philosophy make you want to slit your wrist by the time you've finished the foreword. Ridley is actually an optimist, and he gives an example of the scale of technological achievement over a long, long period of time. He's not just talking about the banking crash. And he asks the following question. Ask how much artificial light you can earn with an hour of work at the average age. The amount is increased from 24 hours in 1750 BC, using a sesame oil lamp, to 186 in 1800, uh, using a tallow candle, to 4,400 in 1880, a kerosene lamp, to over half a million in 1950, an incandescent light bulb, to 8.4 million lumen hours today using a compact fluorescent light bulb. Put another way, an hour of work today earns you 300 days worth of reading light. An hour of work in 1800 earns you 10 minutes of reading light. That's an improvement uh, going right back to the 1750 BC, a 43,200 fold improvement using the measurement that you should care about your time. So that's what people can afford on an average wage. And I think that is a good way of, um, of actually indicating how important economic growth uh, has been. I think also people want it. I think there's a danger in public policy terms of saying, oh, you know, people aren't only motivated by money, and of course they're not. But to take a very recent uh, indication, you know, the, the trade unions were out in force of the, on the streets of London, Glasgow and Belfast yesterday, and they were waving banners saying Britain needs a pay rise. They were not waving banners saying, please cut my pay a little bit and give me an extra day off work. Uh, they are actually seeking more resources, not less, compared to where uh, they, they have got. So I think people want it. Um, and I sometimes think that politicians second guessing what people want is a dangerous idea that they don't really want extra pay or extra resources, they want extra happiness. The cases against it, the problems against you know, well, economic growth, you know, is it really sustainable? Um, well, things that aren't sustainable don't get sustained. Uh, it has been uh, pretty sustainable uh, over the course of the uh, last few hundred years, well, certainly since the Industrial Revolution, uh, I don't see any reason to believe that we're about to hit the buffers any time fast. And in fact, the economic recession we've had is a one-off incident to do with the banking crash. It is not because we have reached the limits of growth. Um, in terms of just looking at the UK, for example, you would think from contemporary political debate that we are a chronically overcrowded island uh, and we can't allow anybody else to get in and there is no more room to build any houses if these people did get in. In fact, only 10% of land in UK is developed and only 5% of land in, U in the UK is under concrete. We have not even begun to move to a United Kingdom which is full. I think we could easily include in, in uh, increase the population by a factor of 10 or so over a, re uh, over a relatively short period of time. Inequality, um, I ask the question, how much do we really truly care about it? I think if you have 
the ending of inequality or the minimisation of it as an aim, you probably do have an aim which is uh, contrary to pursuing the maximum economic growth. I confess I haven't read Piketty. I was about to read up, uh, well, about to start reading. Short. Life is too short. Life is too short. But fortunately, a staff member of mine summed up Piketty's book in one sentence for me. He said, uh, given I can sum it up in one sentence, you don't need to read it. And his one sentence was, it's pretty hard to make your first $1 million, but after that it gets easier, uh, which does seem to be the, the cover. And although we've heard some statistics about the poor in America, who's benefiting, is it the top 1% of Americans or the bottom 20%, uh, the success of capitalism across the globe has been, begin to close off discrepancies, not necessarily within nations, but between them. Uh, your prospects of dying in childbirth in China or India radically fallen, uh, thanks to the growth in capitalism. So I don't think we should look at it on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. Of course, all the rage, it's disappeared uh, off the scale a bit in the build-up to and around the, the, the crash, was, you know, should we actually start measuring things like happiness, rather than GDP to give us an indication of how successful our public policies are. So rather than, I don't know, South Korea pointing out and boasting to others that their growth rate has been rather greater than North Korea, we could have the North Korean government boasting that the opinion polls in North Korea show that North Koreans are happier than South Koreans. Uh, certainly in the United Kingdom, uh, I'm highly, highly sceptical about these happiness polls. Uh, they are 7 out of 10 whenever you hold them. Uh, the Brits are continually 7 out of 10 happy. Uh, and you get, you get some fairly quirky and strange things in these polls of happiness, which um, I'm not quite sure how they would inform uh, public policymakers. For example, if you lose a limb in an industrial accident or in war, your happiness not unsurprisingly drops off. But after two years, it's about back to where it was beforehand. What is the public policy implication of this discovery? <laughs> that the, the government can harvest human limbs as long as it does at the early stage of a parliament. It might have a little bit of midterm unpopularity, but by the time you get to the next general election, everybody will be as happy as they were uh, previously. I think the challenge, and this is linked to growth, my last thought is productivity. That's really what we're aiming for. If you're a highly productive person, you can, it's easier for you to trade off you know, how many hours you work against getting the certain necessities that Kitty was underlining. If you're highly productive, you can earn enough money to buy your bread, your water, your milk, your housing, your electricity in a couple of hours a week if you're hugely productive, and then you can decide whether you want to work longer hours in order to buy the luxuries or whether you want a mixture of leisure time or half and half. And productivity is really what we should be looking at. And here in the UK, I think we have a problem. I don't know if literacy and numeracy are perfect pro proxies for productivity. I don't suppose they are, but I suppose it's a reasonably good proxy. And the latest PISA stats indicate that 15 to 20-year-olds are less numerate and literate than 55-year-olds plus. This is a staggering concern and worry if you want to see not merely economic growth, but economic growth and less hours worked. So I think the challenge here is productivity. If you crack that, you get more growth. And by God, people want it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. <clears throat> and Ricardo, I'm going to let you, let you come back in. You've probably got a number of things uh, you want to, to pick up, but I suppose it sort of relates around, I mean, one of your main points was around the sort of the 1% getting more. Um, do you see that as a problem of growth? Does it result from growth, and if we had less growth, there'd be better distribution? Or are you, just to clarify what you're saying, are you saying that um, we should have growth, you said it's not a bad thing, we should just add on redistribution as well? That's, uh, yeah, that's that's more or less... Uh what I, what, I, what I would say, because, I mean, I guess, as, as, as you mentioned, I, I, I mean, I think growth is important, and, 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 and let me repeat that, over the past 200 years, growth has been one of the, one of the massive forces for, for the improvements in well-being in, in, in humankind. But it's not always that, uh, that uh, it, it does not always follow necessarily that from growth you'll get uh, to that mission that Kitty was, was mentioning. It depends on the context, and the contexts are changing. 
And, and one of the things that is changing dramatically is the concentration of income and wealth in the top 1%. And, and that relates to, over the past 15 years, one thing that we've learned from academic literature is the importance of institutions. The importance of uh, what we call, uh, or what some people call, call inclusive or exclusive institutions. And, 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 and the danger of, of, uh, of, of a process uh, in which you see economic growth, but it, that, that economic growth is concentrated on the top end of the distribution, is that uh, then you end up having uh, then you end up having political processes that that reflect the view of, of, of a few, what some people call affluence and influence, and 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 then you get uh, you get uh, you start having uh, biased institutions against the majority. I'm from Mexico. And uh, Mexico actually grew quite fast in the 50s and in the 60s. People called that the, the Mexican miracle. And, uh, and right now, uh, I mean, the miracle is to think that there was a, a Mexican miracle. <laughs> uh, it, was, it, was, it was part of that, that obsession that, like, I mean, if we only think on growth, then, then, then everything will follow. But, but the inclusion, the, inclusion, the, the inclusive uh, political process didn't follow. The, the, the inclusive uh, kind of like uh, socioeconomic process didn't follow. And then, and then what followed was years of corruption and then and now years of violence. And, and so it is, important, it is important to have growth, but it is important to, to pay attention to what's the quality of that growth. It's in, and particularly the current context, in my view, it, the, one of the big dangers is that concentration of income and wealth. Because, uh, because uh, I mean, one of our arguments is this concentration of income and wealth is accompanied by concentration of power. Kitty, can I actually bring you in on, on this? Because the way you were, you were talking about growth is, a, is we should see it as a machine, uh, and then w when it starts to bang and clatter a bit too much, you know, that's a sort of warning to add oil to, to keep it going. We, there, there was no choice. It has to keep going. It's a bit like... I don't know, a shark in the water, and, the, and the, the, the rule of the government is to you know, put blood in front of it every <laughs> once in a while. But do you, do you recognize that there's a... You know, governments have... Uh, public policies had a, a, a sort of different attitude over the last 20 years to it, it seems. Rather than keeping the machine working efficiently, they've also been doing things that, um, you know, you might call throwing spanners in the works. So when the German government closes down its nuclear power, you think, you know, hang on. You know, what's gone wrong in the, this economic powerhouse of Europe, so, uh, supposedly, that their public policy seems directly, <coughs> you know, counter to, to what you're, you're suggesting? Well, do you see that sort of problem of limits being imposed on growth? No, I think what Germany's doing is quite exciting. I think by demonstrating a very clear policy objective, they're basically saying to the market, right, let's change to make this work. Um, that's what it says to me anyway, um, and that's a perfect, I mean, I don't know a huge amount about the German energy markets, there'll, there'll be some expert here who'll prove I'm incorrect, but uh, I think it's quite a good example of saying, right, growth is a um, machine here, and the role of government is to make sure that that machine is running. Um, my, uh, <laughs> my metaphor is going to run out. I'm not sure, but it's, it's, it's about putting oil in it, but perhaps it's building the road and telling you which way that that machine should go in order to get to your final um, end point. Um, and I'm not sure it was quite oil and spanners. I think the role of government is to make sure that the engine is, func is going at the, you know, the speed that means it won't blow up, at the risk of really pushing this one. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, when things start, when you have a funny noise over here, then you need to do something about it to keep the whole thing going, rather than pouring more oil if it's basically dead. I'm going to stop there before this gets really bad. <laughs> Does that answer Ma your question? Ma Mark, help us out with the machine. Well, I mean, I, I think we might be... Uh, Kitty um, admits that the analogy is getting tortuous, but uh, let me give another go at it. I mean, the machine is built by the people. It is not built by the government. The machine is built by millions, billions of individual decisions, actions on the productivity of the human rights. Uh, the government turns along and nicks some of the petrol and the hubcaps. That's the government's contribution to the machine. Uh, I think that the... Now, they may be doing something of great social worth with those hubcaps and the petrol they steal out of the machine that we wouldn't do ourselves. Um, but I don't think that we should look at the problem of economic growth as sort of what enormous machine should the state construct or what huge road should it construct for it to go down. The, the engine of growth is, is individual... Uh, men and women, and their productivity, their imagination, and their entrepreneurialism. 
And then the trade-off, and I, I think you know, all but uh, people who uh, favour no redistribution, which is not my position, or those that favour total redistribution, need to accept that there is a certain trade-off here. Because um, if you're determined to get more money from the 1% to give to the bottom 10% of society, you know, it's not obvious that a 100% tax rate achieves that. The top 1% cease bothering to work at that point. So what is the optimum level of redistribution? What is the optimum level of hub caps uh, and uh, amounts of petrol that the government can confiscate from the machine? And it's my judgment that at the moment it's confiscating rather too much, being rather too directive about how the machine operates. And if you want economic growth, this is a very simple way of looking at it, but the evidence would suggest that some of the fastest growing countries in the world have a government sector of around about 20%, maybe 25%. The former Soviet Union, most economists would agree, had a government sector of about 70%. It's hard to be sure because the data isn't wholly reliable. And we in Western Europe have a government sector of around about 45% or so. Do we think positioning ourselves about slap bang in the middle between the fastest growing economies in the world and the former Soviet Union is the optimal place to position ourselves if we want a fast running, high acceleration, flashy machine. I don't think it is. So I'd like the government to do a little bit less. The machine is the system, it's not the people. Yeah, the government creates a system and the people are the bits inside the machine, each doing their different bit in the system. Can we, let's, let's switch metaphors. So uh, <laughs> away, away from machines and into natural uh, growth. So, so children grow. Uh, up to a certain level of potential, and they probably grow faster when you feed them well, um, as opposed to uh, if, if you don't feed them well. Um, <laughs> and also to pick up Mark's, Mark, to pick up Mark's point, um, they reach a different kind of growth potential if you educate them well and uh, bring them up well and so on. Um, and then when you stop being children, you stop growing, and you get to sort of my age, you get fatter, um, which is not growth in, in any sort of good sense. It's arguably not growth at all. And so where I'm going with this is that, Daniel, is in a lot of, the, in, in, in a lot of these discussions, there seems to be quite a lot of obsession with uh, the fatness problem in a way that seems sometimes to you know, be almost designed to take uh, eyes off the absence of growth. Now, I don't want you to start thinking about stunted, abnormally stunted fat children here, but... You need to see the economy a bit, bit like that because quite some of the discussion around limits to just posit all sorts of external limits. Kitty actually said it's like the weather, right? sort, of, sort of out of our control, that we need to then step back and just go on a diet. Uh, not, not sure what to say to that. In economic terms, what the jargon, less embarrassing phrase, is the diminishing marginal utility of consumption. In other words, what, that's what it's talking about. That's what it's talking about. <laughs> uh, and what, what that means is, I mean, to take a kind of uh, example to illustrate it. So if you're uh, really, really on the edge of starvation and someone gives you, you know, a cream bun, then obviously that will probably save your life. That is a really fantastic thing. Uh, but the better off you get, the more well-fed you get, uh, an extra cream bun you doesn't really... Uh, make you any happier, and then beyond a certain point, you get really obese if you eat too many cream buns. So maybe, rather than stunted, stunted child analogy, that might be a better way to explain it. And I think behind that is the idea that we've reached the stage where growth is no longer beneficial to the Western world. And I don't think that is true. I, mean, I think, it, theoretically, it's possible. So it may reach that stage, but I don't think we've reached that stage now. So... Uh, maybe to give two examples. Uh, one, I've already alluded to the whole climate change example, and I'm not an expert. And I don't want to get into the discussion about the extent to which it's a problem. But uh, if we accept for a moment that it is a big problem, then it is going to take a lot of resources. For example, if you want to switch to cleaner energy supply, that will take an awful lot of resources, a huge amount of resources. So you need the wealth to be able to deal with that. Or another thing people talk about is the the demographic, so-called demographic problem. In other words, as a proportion of the population, more and more people are getting older, and that is seen as some kind of problem that you can't deal with. Uh, but I don't see it necessarily as a problem. I'm for, as it happens, first of all, a lot of elderly people are quite active. But even leaving that aside, if you've got a very productive, wealthy, dynamic economy, 
then the fact that you have a higher proportion of old people is not a problem because you've got the resources to deal with them. So we need resources to deal with those kind of things. And I would say also, even in the West, people could do with more living standards. And it's not an end in itself. No one said that. It's a, it's a means to an end. Yeah. But, but if you want to uh, spend a lot of time writing poetry or going fishing or whatever you want to do, to have the spare time to do that and have a decent standard of living, you need to have a highly productive, uh, developed, dynamic economy. Clearly, people in the poorer countries are further back, but I still think there's considerable scope in the West to uh, have more growth and benefit from more prosperity. Um, I've been annoyed about some of the analogies in that, you know, economic growth uh, has a technical definition, and it's the amount of change in GDP, and GDP has itself a definition. And so there's some things which were said which I think are not right. And I'm, not a I'm not an economist. There's doubtless lots of economists in the room. Is that, um, you know, that... Uh, for example, if the government decided to mandate that everybody kept their gardens tidy and then people would have to go out and buy lawnmowers, petrol, hire gardeners and all the rest, that would increase uh, GDP, that would be economic growth. Um, if a government decides to embark upon an um, austerity programme and people get sacked from government, that reduces GDP and that would reduce economic growth and people would think that uh, one was caused by the other, which of course it is, or that it's a bad thing, which of course it's not, in my view. Um, similarly, if uh, to, you know uh, recreational fishing, if that became compulsory, then all that would that would mean that there'd be economic growth. So it, <coughs> that economic growth uh, is a target in itself. It's obviously a bad idea, and the type of economic growth is what's important. And everybody ought to agree that it's not a, a left or right issue. Um, um, uh, th the other thing is about the whether or not the banking, it was mentioned that the banking crisis was uh, not inevitable. There's this thing about economic growth where, you know, the checkerboard story where um, out of a reward somebody's offered one grain of rice on the first, two on the second, four on the third checkerboard list until you've got two to the power of 64 grains of wheat. What that means is if you have a 2% economic growth for 35 years, you must have a doubling in productivity or you have to have artificial uh, economic growth created by uh, fiat money expansion and money supply, massive creation of debt, and followed by a banking crisis. Mm -hmm. So I think um, uh, the other point is maybe is that uh, the 43,200 improvement in, in the availability of light, that's true. But what isn't true with economic growth is you can't buy more hours of labour, you can't buy more live entertainment. I'm a psychologist, so I'm looking at the level beneath what economics is looking at. Um, a psychologist will tell you that optimising happiness top-down, to your comment on cutting off limbs and all that, is not possible because happiness is optimised at the individual level, it is a choice. That said, power corrupts. And that we know for sure as, as, as psychologists. So when power is aggregated at the very top, I'm afraid those people don't even have a choice. They will continue optimizing their own utility. So it's really a question about redistribution. And I re respect the opinion of the gentleman who flanked the chair. But I'm afraid we're heading for a problem with that concentration of power. It's, it's very important to, to point out that if you consider growth to, as a means to an end, which I think everyone has stated in some form or another, then ignoring measuring your ends is, doesn't make any sense. Um, and if you consider your ends to be some level of social well-being across the board, then you have to consider things like inequality um, very importantly. Um, and when you talk about are your ends reached only by economic growth, clearly that's not true because there are many counterfactuals in that case. You could look at Cuba, for example, which has low economic growth but very large investment in health and has a very good health care system. Um, that is where they focused on one of the ends, which we also have, which is improved health, um, and they've not had the growth uh, sort of, they, they haven't sort of looked at this general growth. Um, and. Uh, yeah, and I, th I think this is very important. When you look around, when you live in London, uh, when you see that there's a gold-plated Ferrari driving around, uh, around Kensington uh, while hospitals are crumbling, 
you really have to question whether this focus on economic growth has, even in our developed Western society, achieved what we hoped for. I think a very interesting thing about the consensus on the panel is that everyone, including Ricardo, who's got a few qualifications, is supportive of growth. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be any intellectual uh, distaste for growth, and yet the big elephant in the corner over there, the big elephant in this room, is that Kitty's machine is, in the West, clapped out. There isn't enough growth going on. There hasn't been. There's been a steady decline in growth rates, however you measure them, since the 1970s. So we have this contrast between a, an intellectual agreement that growth is a good thing and the reality that the West is unable to grow, which I think poses a question for us as to what are the, is the real barrier to that growth. Now, that's a theme we've been discussing yesterday in the, in the economy, austerity dilemma strands. My take on it is that you, I cannot see any technological barriers to growth, to the investment that's needed in order to produce growth. I can't see any technical barriers. I can't see any economic barriers, any financial barriers, loads of money out there, loads of companies with cash. I don't really think there's fiscal barriers. That's to be a disagreement between me and Mark. I don't think it is that the, the state's taking too much away. The, and there's not any intellectual barriers. I think this, the views on the panel are uh, replicated the themes of the IMF annual meeting last week, where there was a complete consensus that we need more public investment because that's what's necessary for long-term growth. So the barriers aren't in our ideas, it seems to me, or in economics. It seems to me the barriers must be somewhere else. And, and to me, those barriers are cultural barriers, that the intellectual support for growth and all the good ideas and all the good statistics that have been given about life expectancy and about you know, the more we can do and the more light we can have, all that gets swamped and washed away because Western society has lost faith in the future. You know, the businesses are not investing because they're not, they have this profound uncertainty about whether they're going to get return in the future. And it's that loss of belief that the future is a better place, that cultural uh, change, that cultural shift, which seems to me at the root of the fact that however much we want growth, we're not getting it. And until we challenge that, until we, in a sense, to be blunt, resurrect you know, enlightenment values that progress is a good thing and not a problematic thing, then we're not going to, however much we argue on the statistics, we're never going to re-establish that dynamic mm. again. I want to echo the, the speaker in black who took up one of the points made by some of the speakers that uh, growth is essentially a means to an end and it's very important to keep the ends in mind rather than get over-focused on the means. As an example of getting over-focused on the means, I was very struck by Mark talking about productivity and the image he created that all we need to do is import more and more workers, build more and more concrete so we cover the whole of England with houses and concrete with productive workers. That doesn't strike me as an idea for a utopia. I think it's vitally important that we keep our eyes on what we're trying to achieve. And the, the, I'm not sure it's true to say that countries with the highest economic growth are the happiest countries. And I dispute with Mark that it's not easy to measure well-being, but there are many indicators of well-being. And it's, it's a complex task. It's also not easy to measure economic growth. We've not discussed here what are the measures of economic growth we're using. Some of those are highly questionable, I think. So the okay. point I'm trying to make is that, uh, echoing that last speaker, that, uh, the pre previous speaker, that we need to focus on the ends and to look at whether, in fact, economic growth will produce well-being in our society. One of the issues that Ricardo raises is absolutely correct, that if you have a tremendous disparity in the income levels of people in your society, even though the wealth level may be high, it will not produce well-being among the population. There's a lot of evidence on that. We've got four questions around sort of the inequality and the ends are more important than the means uh, and sort of in the happiness thing. And two, sort of on where's the productivity uh, and what's in standing in the way of it. But uh, Mark, come back on any or all or... or well, on the, or on the means of, versus... Of those. On, on the means versus ends thing, I mean, I think that the question's this, sort of who sets the ends? I mean, what's the exact balance that we want between hospitals and gold-plated Ferraris? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, and I don't believe we can collectively reach an answer to that. I mean, I, for all I know, we've got a few too many hospitals and not enough gold-plated Ferraris to, as, to assuage the preferences of the wider population. It's not obvious to me that when we set ends that you can sort of jump these hurdles quite so quickly and say, well, obviously everybody would agree healthcare is an end. 
Obviously, everybody would agree that gold-plated Ferraris are a luxury item. Therefore, we should smash up the gold-plated Ferraris and convert them into hospitals or give the gold-plated <laughs> stuff to more nurses or something. The ends, to my mind, need to be set by the, the people themselves. And mm. so, you know, I, I, I dare say virtually everybody considers uh, access to reasonable health care to be a good end, but that doesn't really get you very far. How much of your income do you want to spend on health care? 5%, 10%, 40%? So I don't think we can really focus on the ends, or at least as a collective, I think it's extremely difficult for us to um, focus uh, on, the, on the ends rather than the means. Why uh, unable to grow? I think there are some more prosaic reasons than uh, pessimism. Um, I, I don't think that pessimism necessarily acts as a, as a block to growth. Uh, I think we make it difficult for entrepreneurialism and new ideas to flourish and we are a maybe this is a reflection of the cultural point but we are a safety first sort of country and culture somebody brings a whole new idea to market and the almost the first thing that the government wants to do is to say let's regulate this or which out work out which regulator needs to be all over it we can't possibly take the risk that this new thing i don't know if you were to take say e-cigarettes as an example the state is everywhere is not just in the uk is just determined to regulate them um but just on well-being the, the, i think the pro there are lots of measurements of this but they are still problematic i mean there was i I, remember, I can't remember the numbers now but i remember going to a lecture about how sweden you know sweden was very happy and therefore we should try and replicate sweden but it turned out when you dug below the numbers swedes who moved themselves to texas were just as happy as Swedes who kept themselves in Stockholm. And Texans who moved to Sweden were just as miserable as Texans <laughs> who stayed in Dallas. So this seemed to be something about being Swedish rather than something about the Swedish economy. Okay. Ricardo. Yeah, that, that actually, um, in, in, in the context of means and ends, because that, that segues very well into the inequality uh, discussion. I, one of the arguments is that with the growing disparities that we see, actually the people who set the ends are the people with the with the golden Ferraris, and then they say, "Oh, like, but like, I mean, you you will benefit of seeing all these golden Ferraris on the street," and they have a, a, a very similar uh, uh, discourse as, as as Marx and saying, "Well, I mean, this is, I mean, this is this is the public discourse. This is this is what uh, this is what we've decided as a society, except that we, the people owning all the Ferraris." decide because we have access to the political process and and, and we actually said said not only the means but we set the rules on how we decide those means and that that might sound like uh you know something like uh, so something that i'm making up but I, I i would encourage you to read the the research from from princeton academics you know so so this is this is the top of of, of the academic world who are working on these issues of affluence and influence uh, larry bartles martin gillens benjamin page and they 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 have shown with careful studies how the the political the political systems that that, that uh, where where income inequality is growing actually start reflecting more and more the views of the wealthy you know, in the way I, I was just describing, there's statistical analysis showing that, and that's one of the big one of the big worries. Okay. Who sets the, the, the who sets the, the 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 ends, and who sets the rules to determine the ends? And that's one of the things I wanted to raise. Okay, thank you, and Daniel. I'm itching to come back on the inequality debate, but I'll restrain myself for now, and I want to come back on what uh, Phil Mullen said because I think uh, it, there is a. It's absolutely untrue to claim, as some people, as most people claim, that politicians are just going for growth and trying to maximise GDP. Just as a, I'm not talking here about what I think is good or bad. Just as a factual description of reality, that is absolute nonsense. That is just not true if you read the debates. Uh, because, I mean, Ricardo is absolutely right to say very few people, hardly anyone, is a deep green. Very few people say, I want no growth and we want to stand still. There are some people who say that, but they're a tiny minority. The overwhelming consensus is we need to constrain growth. We need to limit growth. GDP as a measure is a problem. And you can see this reflected in all sorts of ways. So the OECD, you know, big e economic think tank, and the, the UN, and the British government, and the French government, and all these Nobel Prize winners, for example, are all talking about we need alternative measures of well-being rather than GDP. 
And it's not really about GDP as a measure. You can find all sorts of flaws with GDP. It's really about an attachment to economic growth. And pretty much every or every single Western government has accepted this notion of sustainability. And it's kind of seen as straightforward because, yes, things have to be sustainable, otherwise they don't carry on. Actually, it's not true. The idea of sustainability really came, began to come to the fore in the 1980s. And it is a very conservative idea. In fact, in a literal kind of Burkean sense, conservative. Because what it's really saying is that, well, for the sake of future generations, we now have to hold ourselves back. If we're going to have development, there was a big UN report accepted by all Western governments, the Brundtland Report in 1987, I think it came out, which said, we believe in sustainable development, which, is, which means we've just got to, got to concentrate on the uh, essential needs of the poorest of the poor. So what that's really saying is, OK, let's just focus on the poorest of the poor, but never mind the, the non-essential needs of the, the poorest of the poor, let alone the majority of society. So I think it should be factually incontestable, wherever you stand in this debate, that the mainstream view is saying growth should be constrained, <coughs> growth should be limited, growth is problematic. Only th these people don't have the clarity to say that they're uh, against growth. It's just expressed through all these kind of nagging doubts and anxieties. I don't think policymakers think that growth should be constrained. I think they think it should be spread or channeled. Um, but we can carry on debating that. Uh, what I got from the last 15 minutes or so, uh, what I picked out of it is two sort of yearnings. Um, on the one hand, quite a strong yearning to understand what the ends are. You know, acceptance that growth is a means to an end. It gives you more uh, potential to achieve an end. But both the gentleman there and over here um, were sort of trying to articulate that in a sense, wanting to believe in some kind of utopia that we could use growth for, or if not utopia, at least sort of technocratic uh, ends. At the same time, you get the uh, psychologist, if I got you right, and, um, and, and Mark saying, well, actually, it's your individual choice as to whether you are happy or whether you, how you define your ends. And I think this is a really interesting debate here, because is it actually the role of policy makers to say, well, we, we create an, an environment to make it easier for you to do what it is you, you want to do, and there's a sort of libertarian approach, and we can debate how much um, you know, kind of government we need in order to do that uh, or not? Or are people actually yearning to say, well, we're going to be the most sustainable, progressive, egalitarian, you know, prosperous, cheerful country uh, in the wide, in, in the whole world where we manage to get the sunshine uh, as well and harness the forces uh, of nature and your part in this is A, B, C, D and let's all come together and go into the sunset, which is quite attractive if, you know, if that's kind of right. But then as Mark says, it's impossible to get a kind of consensus view as to what right is and so we have messy democracy um, because that's better than concentrating power in someone's hands but I sense a kind of yearning there and I think that's the kind of unanswered question uh, in this debate I want to give two little just to, one sentence with two things in uh, <laughs> spanners in the works just from some of the research we've done recently I'm publishing something on if I speak fast it will be one sentence um, I'm publishing something on Tuesday that looks at the attitudes uh, of uh, the poorest paid the minimum wage workers and um, what's very interesting is that there's a large cohort of part-time um, older uh, women who are paid the bottom of the pile who are extremely content right chuck that in the other thing is don't know if they should be don't know if we'd want them to be but they are I'm not saying they shouldn't change but it's just true uh, the other thing is that um uh, did some research on the concept of good growth, or we did a complicated piece of statistics to reveal people's real preferences. And what that showed very clearly is for people who were in work, they would be prepared to pay to have a little bit more leisure time. So that's what the public as a whole says. So maybe that's what government should try and give. So we talk about growth and we talk a lot about policymakers. Does it matter if people around the dinner table are talking about growth and care about it? And if so, why? The other thing is about geography. So when we talk about, uh, we talk a lot about international uh, e examples. Take uh, the UK as a country. If it's growing um, and growing fast, does it matter where, if that's all centralised within the south, in the north? So do we need to talk about the distribution of growth as well as the, the ends of growth? And the final thing is uh, very uh, much about um, how long does it matter about the time lag? So if the country is growing and I'm, and I'm contributing towards that uh, through my productivity, through my labour, does it matter not just how much of that goes into my pocket, but how long it takes to get there? You cannot have growth without ends. It is impossible. Every person gets up to go to work because they have an end in their mind. Now, whether that will be 
because they care about animal welfare or because they care about children or because they care about Ferraris, whatever it is, there is always an end. If I believe that my end is superior to someone else's and because I happen to be a member of a big group, I force my end on the other person, then that other person loses the incentive to produce any growth. Therefore, the two go hand in hand. It's impossible to have okay. growth without an end. Is technology going to take policymakers out of the loop when it comes to growth? Policymakers didn't have much involvement in five billion people getting mobile phones or the growth of Google and Facebook. In the future, policymakers aren't going to have much to do about 3D printing or um, you know, uh, biomedical advances. Frankly, is this discussion relevant or is essentially it's all going to be done in Silicon Valley in Shanghai? Uh, it does strike me hearing a couple of the contributions that um, uh, in the past, whether you w called yourself left wing or you were more conservative, there was a general consensus that growth was good and development was good and having some ambition was good. And then you'd have something called politics about how you may kind of do things in society, whether it's to do with hospitals or education. And it strikes me that there's an almost quasi-religious um, but secular view that actually ambition and big-scale projects and growth and development uh, are, are problematic. They, they represent a, a kind of folly of human uh, ideals uh, <clears throat> imposing itself uh, on the world. And it's not just an economic discussion, it's, it's more pervasive in society. And I guess the question I've got is, in a discussion about growth, should we widen that even further to a more abstract discussion about how we consider what we're doing here more broadly? Okay, this is a question for Mark because he said something very interesting. He said that um, it's very difficult today for entrepreneurs to carry through their projects. And my question is, um, what, what does he see that, uh, is the cause of that? Is that because entrepreneurs are being bound down by something objective? Because my idea is uh, there is a different reason. There must be a political reason for it because entrepreneurs themselves are not doing what they should be doing to, support, to foster growth. Best example is Germany where I come from. Now, Kitty might think the uh, energy change is a great project. Nobody really in Germany thinks that anymore. And uh, most entrepreneurs will tell you it's a complete nonsensical project, but they can't say that and they won't say that because they know they're running up against you know, a huge amount of political problems. So it seems to me a, a much more you know, differentiated problem we have, a, maybe a cultural problem, a political problem. What exactly is it? Do you not think there's, like, uh, like there's a finite expansion to growth? Like, isn't it restricted to the amount of resources that is available in the world? And the point about inequality, so growth leading to inequality, don't, we, don't you think that inequality is, can be seen as a good thing? So the increased gap between the rich and the poor, whereby the poor people would have the, like a, a goal point for them to increase like, <laughs> mentally and sort of see that as a, as a goal to reach for. So therefore, I can see inequality as being as a good thing. Yeah, that, that, that's called the parking your gold Ferrari in bad neighborhoods theory. <laughs> My question is for Ricardo. He mentioned several times the concept of quality of growth. Now, I take it to mean that he says uh, he would be willing to forego some growth for a different distribution of it, perhaps uh, a more equal one. But I think by now we know that uh, rising living standards are only sustainable when you have economic growth. And so foregoing growth would mean effectively having to tell some people that they will have to forego their pay rise or that increase in their well-being, their children's well-being, and especially in, in developing countries. Now, it seems to me that that is morally quite troubling, especially when the uh, motivation to forego that growth is just an aesthetic preference for, for fewer people to own gold-plated Ferraris. It had been said somewhere in this discussion uh, that the policymaker's job is to steer the economic force towards the right direction, whatever it might be, but relatively short electoral cycles may stifle the ideals of politicians to pander to populist policies that are knee-jerk reactions and that may not lead to the best long-term policies. So is there a solution to that? And also, just as a general question, is growth a zero-sum game? I just wonder whether we could just return to the question from the lady in orange, which was to explain the role of billionaire bankers in uh, a growth uh, in this country. Very simple question. Um, it just strikes me that we've, in this country, have pursued a route of going down uh, financial services, debt-driven consumption, asset bubbles, etc. whereas somewhere like Germany has chosen a very different route to growth, mm -hmm. about manufacturing and skills and exports. 
I just hope the panel could talk about different approaches to growth. The, the basis for growth is the ability of business people to make sufficient returns on their investment. And if the climate is one where they're not sure and there's uncertainty mm -hmm. about what the returns on that investment might be, then that is going to have an effect on their willingness to like, invest and to allow the conditions for that growth to take place. So I'm just curious as to whether the panel thinks that there is a desire amongst entrepreneurs to make these investments, but most of the time it's some institutional barrier that prevents them from making the profits that are out there to be made, or is it something else? Because the idea of cultural pessimism as the basis for why entrepreneurs are not taking the opportunities that are out there to make the profits that are to be had, I find that less than convincing. Uh, Mark said earlier that there's a trade-off between uh, uh, redistribution and incentives. Um, I think that's true, but I disagree how much. I think that not enough redistribution can also harm it. Um, one of the most inefficient uses of our finite resources surely is the people in the world who don't have enough income to have an education. If we give them an education, human capital means they'll produce more. That means we have more growth. So can equality and growth not be enemies as such, but work together? Very quickly, it's just a question about agency. Like, how much agency do we really have on the economic growth question? Like, the gentleman over there asked a point about, like, Germany chose an industrial path, whereas Britain chose a financial services path. Did we really choose those paths? The Big Bang and Canary Wharf was actually largely a product of luck in the early 1980s. Could we say that we actually chose the, the, our current industrial structure? If the members of the panel had to choose a measure of government success that was not GDP, which ones would they choose? It's an obvious point, growth isn't development, you, and no one's mentioned this, I'm surprised. You can pay lots of people to destroy lots of buildings, and you can pay another lot of people to put them up again. In the end, you, you've got growth, but whether or not you've done anything else is another matter. What element, this, the discussion about wealth inequality is related to the general trend to the um, financialization of the economy as opposed to um, profits being reinvested into the productive side of the economy. I don't know if anyone can comment mm -hmm. on that. Just on this question of growth being a means to an end and not an end in itself, if you take that uh, position, uh, my friend in the black t-shirt, it's just important to think, well, what are you excluding uh, as, end, uh, as an end? Because if, if uh, GDP and growth is the provision of goods and services, and if you don't consider the provision of goods and services as ends in themselves, then what is left as an end? And there does seem to be a tendency to interpret the end, the human end, in terms of uh, well-being and fulfilment, uh, which it, it perhaps is, is more of an emotional end, uh, or health and well-being, sorry. And is there a tendency to uh, elide uh, private ends and a private emotional fulfilment with public ends, which is what we do uh, in, in our relationship with strangers? Mark, at the um, very start of this discussion, you mentioned uh, two things. Firstly, you said that um, so far um, growth has been uh, sustainable. I think that's a fairly questionable statement because um, of uh, the waste fields and uh, air pollutions, uh, uh, air pollution in China, and uh, obviously climate change, among other things. And secondly, you said that what um, isn't sustainable doesn't get sustained. And again, that sounds uh, fairly questionable, as uh, as humans are not very um, good at caring about long-term risks. We're not very good at assessing long-term risks, and therefore. Uh, until they get very severe, there is uh, no need to mention, uh, or notice them or take care of uh, these risks. Just with the thought that less is more, I wonder if we consumed less, whether we would grow more. Uh, right, let's do the financial services thing, because a few people have come up with that. Uh, financial services is about 10% of the British economy. We've had a financial service crisis, so we're worrying about that. When we had an oil crisis in the 1970s, we worried about dependence on oil. When we have an exchange rate crisis, we worry about dependence on manufacturing. I'm proud of the fact that Britain has one of the best financial services uh, sectors in the world, just as I would be proud if we had the best environmental technologies or the best um, energy production or the best um, you know, ability to create widgets or theatres. Um, so I think what we've learned from the financial crisis is that there are, is the potential for systemic weakness in it, and that requires a regulatory uh, response, um, and also that consumers in Britain sometimes get a bit over-indebted, which didn't cause the crisis, but it did mean when we started to panic, we had further to go to retrench in order to feel happy, and that in itself uh, exacerbated the recession. Um, in terms of bankers, I don't know. I think there's a 
really interesting kind of competition policy question as to why some sectors of the economy end up sustaining higher salaries than others. I think the correct policy response is progressive taxation um, so that that group contributes more because they have more to give. And that's kind of all I think about financial services. Okay, so you can draw your own uh, conclusions. The big one, I suppose, is what's getting in the way. What's getting in the way of what? Right. Yeah, which is you raised uh, earlier on. Um, I think there's a big difference between the biggest and most prosperous countries, if we're going to take a country uh, analogy, uh, and the kind of catch-up ones. I think it's quite hard to grow. Well, the last hundred years have shown it's quite hard to grow more than about two or three percent a year on average if you're at the forefront of technology. But as long as you keep doing the sensible things around investing in infrastructure, investing in talent. And crucially, government investing at the forefront of technology. There's some interesting research about how some of the major uh, innovations in bioscience and Silicon Valley and so on, the actual bit of science was government funded and it was then commercialised. And I think as long as you know, the kind of richer countries uh, keep doing that, then they will remain growing at what you might call that kind of sustainable rate. For other countries who have a certain amount of catch up and are copying. Uh, innovations from elsewhere, you can grow faster. So I'm, I'm optimistic about our ability to keep on doing that. But as I've said several times before, I also think there's a policy choice uh, in terms of you know, the type of system, try not to say car, that you want to um, create out of that. And that determines uh, the sort of relative advantage of different types of investment. I think if this is my last few seconds, I've been reminded listening to these really fantastic uh, contributions from many people more expert uh, than us in the audience of a conversation I had when I was about 16 with a friend of my mum's and I was being very lefty and the, and the topic of conversation was uh, should you go into the city and I remember saying very strongly um, I'm never going to go into the city, I'm not motivated by money, I can't imagine how sad it is to spend your whole life wanting to get richer and richer and richer and uh, I'm definitely not doing that and so end up a Labour politician but anyway <laughs> um, <laughs> discuss um, but I remember the friend of my mum's in a very irritatingly sensible way saying of course you don't need money of course you don't need money, of course you shouldn't do that but it helps. And so that begs the question, what does it help for? And I think that's where, you know, perhaps we should take our brains after this postprandial conversation. Thank you very much, Kitty. Uh, Daniel? Uh, yeah, there are so many excellent questions, I can't possibly answer all of them. Uh, I'm happy to talk to people individually, or even better, if you want to buy a copy of my book, for all, <laughs> and to everything. improve my bank balance. <laughs> it, de it deals with questions such as scarce resources, which I think is a very common view, but which I think is also a myth. Just uh, maybe to focus on the inequality thing and the couple of minutes I've got left. First of all, <clears throat> sorry, it's, it's really striking that almost every single Western leader is saying that extreme inequality is a problem. You know, you've got the Pope, you've got Barack Obama, you've got Ed Miliband, you've got David Cameron, you've even got the governor of the Bank of England saying that extreme inequality is a problem. And in fact, it's interesting that Ricardo's report uh, about the 85 uh, richest people and their wealth was first presented to the World Economic Forum, which is a, really a form of plutocrats who meet on the side of a, a Swiss mountain uh, every year. Uh, so there's a complete consensus among the elite that extreme inequality is a problem. That doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong, but you have, you've got to start being suspicious. You know, when the really rich and powerful are actually talking about what a problem it is, that there are so many rich and powerful people around, you've got to start thinking, well, what's going on? Secondly, all of them say, when you listen carefully, and in fact, Ricardo also says this, not that he's incredibly rich, as far as I know, but that we don't, oh, no. we, we, we don't believe in equality. We're not arguing for equality. What they say is that they are, they're worried about extreme inequality. So equality is there, they're worried that it's got too extreme, which is quite interesting. And in fact, there is a point there that as long as we have a market economy, a capitalist society, there is going to be a high degree of inequality. Now, we can have a discussion about overthrowing capitalism. That's not the subject of this panel. But I think as long as we have a market economy, a, a class society, if you want to use the old terminology, there is going to be a high degree of inequality. As it happens, I think the mainstream discussion about how problematic extreme inequality is, is very problematic. And people, this is, isn't really a point understood, because as well as being used to sell 
lower living standards, as I talked about at the beginning, the kind of the idea of shared sacrifice. It's also being used to say what we need to do is to restrict personal freedoms. Uh, you can see this very much in the Spirit Level book, and people might know Wilkinson and Pickett, because the argument is, well, there's all these kind of socially excluded, uh, the poorer people, the socially excluded, uh, they're being separated from the rest of society. We can't really have much redistribution in, in economic terms. This is a discussion. What we really need to do is to start interfer interfering in their lives to make sure they behave properly. So, you know, all, all these poor people are slipping away from, from the top. You know, we need to regulate how much they drink, how much they smoke, how they have sex, all the rest of it. And you, really, uh, you, you may think I'm mean, overstating the case, but you read a lot of the discussion of inequality and Labour Party and other parties' policy on this, and very much the spectre of extreme inequality is used to justify interfering more and more in people's lives because the idea is that the mass of society is pulling away from the top and it really has to be controlled. Super, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Ricardo. Yeah, so, so <clears throat> a lot of really good questions, but I'm going to focus on the one that was addressed directly to me. And uh, I have to say that I, I, I see a, a big fallacy in, in what, you, what you ask, because uh, you're saying um, no, growth is perfectly correlated with standards of living for the rest. And part of my argument was, well, that's not true. And the, and, and the example I gave was, you know, right after the financial crisis in the US, 95% of economic growth was captured by the 1%. So your question is, is like, I, I, would, I would turn the question, is that morally acceptable? Should we, I mean, should the 90% of the population in the U.S. who got poorer, you know, have to have a say on, on, on whether they prefer like a slightly lower economic growth rate, uh, but 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 something that's 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 better distributed? Uh, and I think that's I mean that's 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 the real question. And and the question is who has a say on how that that uh, I mean who like, how that 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 process. Uh, because it's, uh, I mean, one of the things that accompanied economic growth over the past 200 years that made it uh, successful uh, on, 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 on the long term was the, the democratic process and the process of, of participation, of growing participation of society. And, and one of my points, what I'm trying to, to highlight, is that, that that process, when you, you have like massive concentration of income, is, is, uh, is, is in danger. Thank you very much. Mark. Uh, there was a couple of points uh, put directly to me. One was the sort of sustainability thing, you know, well, is, is it really sustainable? It was put that uh, human beings are, uh, are very bad at assessing long-term risks. Uh, I suspect that might be true, but because human beings are bad at assessing long-term risks, it doesn't mean that politicians and bureaucrats are brilliant at assessing long-term risks. They are, despite some of their behaviour, broadly members of the same species that we are. So why would we consider their ability to judge long-term risk to be any better? What makes them more enlightened? And the whole sustainable growth thing does trouble me. We are allowing a lot of words to sort of enter our language, which I consider to be completely ridiculous. I mean, think again, not of, not of sustainable growth, but let's imagine your boss offers you a very generous pay rise, offers to double your pay uh, this year by 100%. How many of you would say, I'm rather you didn't do that, I don't think it's sustainable. Uh, you would almost certainly take the 100% pay rise, even though, even though you know that you might get a wage freeze next year, or possibly that your job will even end. So it's social entrepreneurship, that's one of the new terms, isn't it? As if any entrepreneur could make money by selling things, goods and services to themselves. I mean, every entrepreneur is social. The word does absolutely no work at all. So social entrepreneurship actually seems to mean entrepreneurship, which doesn't make any money. Um, the, the point on what's the barrier to growth, uh, look, that's, there are endless PhDs in that, and I'm not saying that this is the only thing, but I think it is a thing, because uh, there may be cultural reasons, there may be all sorts of things that are uh, difficult to correct, but the, the scale of regulation and policy uncertainty caused by the government is definitely a barrier to it. You would have to be brave, uh, to put it mildly, or mad, I think, to invest in the energy sector in the UK at the moment, because you have no idea what subsidies or tariffs or obligations are going to apply to your investment in three years' time. Uh, successive governments have just chopped and changed around. If you don't have that certainty, what the hell are you going to do? If you're working in financial services as a start-up operation, rather than as one of the two bigs to fails, 
you've got a huge problem. The regulatory hurdles of doing business in financial services are enormous. In fact, if you look at the trajectory in the UK of the number of people who work in financial services uh, and the number of people who are employed by the state to regulate financial services, by 2070, if you track this from 1980, by 2070 there'll be more regulators than employees. Everyone, in, everyone by 2070 will have their own personal state regulator <laughs> on their shoulder. I don't think that that is the sort of environment in which uh, we can flourish. On financial services versus manufacturing, why are the Germans you know, if you like making widgets and we're selling insurance policies? Kitty touched on this a bit. Focus on what you're good at. I think that goes for the wider economy, not just to an individual human being. Um, uh, I am not very good at cutting hair. I'd like to think I'm just about half competent as an economist. Consequently, I pay somebody else to cut my hair and focus on being a better economist. I'm scared when politicians talk about rebalancing the economy. Why would you want to rebalance away from things you are good at to things you are bad at? Uh, nobody ever suggests that Manchester United Football Club should sort of start playing a bit less football and start <laughs> playing a bit more hockey or something. <laughs> Although, given their performance this season, that might not be a very bad idea. And the last point was, I was like, if, if you don't sort of use GDP as the best measure of whether politicians are going to do a good job or a bad job, what sort of other criteria could we measure? I would like to measure, uh, by looking at politicians, their level of inactivity. And the less active they are, the lazier they are, and the less interfering, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Pay them more. We'll thank our panel.